Today we will begin a two-part series entitled Living and Giving Supernaturally. We will play, uh, we will show you a video right now. That's the building that you're sitting in. That's the Word Dome. It seats 3,000 people. It costs $16 million. It was built debt-free. 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 It's a place where people can learn and grow. That's my beautiful daughter. And she good looking, and she beautiful, and she's single too. See, that, hey, 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 that's my pastor. That's my son. That, that's Pastor Michael K. Moore. He's the lead. That's my beautiful girl. That's my girl. That's my wife. 46 years, 46 years. That's our, what we call the bridge of six domes. Six domes. It costs. $26 million. That's the first dome. It's the lobby dome, has a climbing tower. That's another dome. That's the gymnasium. Full length gymnasium. You pull the seats out, seat about 700 people in there. It's got all kind of stuff in there. Got a walking track upstairs. Got weights. Got a dance area. Cost $26 million dollars. We don't owe anything on it. That's another, that's another uh, dome. It's a 12-lane bowling alley because God is concerned about us, not just spiritually, but God is concerned. That's another dome. That's an indoor playground for kids. When them kids go in there, they don't want to leave that place because God wanted them to know that they could have something nice too. Because our kids have dreams, and when they connect it to big things, they can grow up believing. That's another dome. That's a, another dome where our, our children are. That's another dome right there. It's the venue. Some weddings they have there, some receptions they have there, businesses may have their meetings there. You have different events take there. We went to Las Vegas to see how they do it in Las Vegas. That's why it has that Italian look to it. All paid for. All paid for. What you don't see is the campus is on. That's our first campus right there. We were there for a lot of years. God blessed us and grew up. I went on television in that campus in 1994, and then God blessed us to build what we're building now. What you don't, I uh, did not see that the campus is on 200, I mean, pardon me, 140 acres of land. It's all paid for. And then there's a ministry care center I think we paid about $600,000 for that ministry care center. Now, that's not including all the things we've done with the care center. The, the, that's, what I just throwed out there is, is above $40 million. Isn't that right? Now, now, that's not counting the millions of dollars that we've given away because we tie 10% of everything that comes in the church. And that's not count all the other expenses and things that we have. But a group of people that look just like you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, that's how, I'm, that's how I'm, I'm telling other folks. They look just like you. Not special people. Come on. They were just people who were willing to believe God. Amen. And then I'll tell them this. We didn't have the 40 some million dollars. But God had it. And what God did for us, he'll do 
for you. Now, it may not be a dome campus. Goals will change, strategies will change, but the faith principles that produce that will never change. Now, I want to teach you a lesson and share with you God's ways so that you can walk in it. Any believers here? Okay. This is lesson one. I have an introduction in lesson one, and then I'm going to introduce the concept of provision grace. Just introduce that concept because in our next lesson next uh, week, we'll get into the depth of, of that concept that I'll introduce today. When we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus lived and he gave supernaturally. I'm going to quote John 17, verses 15 through 17 a little later in the lesson. But Jesus says that we are just like him. We're not of this world. And consequently, if Jesus lived and gave supernaturally, we should live and give supernaturally. I want us to look at a, a proof text, and then I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you some points in this introduction, but it's Genesis chapter 22, verses 14 in the authorized King James Version. They'll put it up on uh, the monitor. It says, and Abraham called the name, this is Genesis 22, verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be called. The supreme test of Abraham's faith came when God ordered him to sacrifice his son. Now, God had no intention of him doing it because throughout Scripture, God was totally against human sacrifice. It was a test to Abraham, and Abraham passed the test, and God provided supernaturally. Say Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Say Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. When you say Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, Abraham took his son to this mountain that God instructed him to take his son, built the altar, tied his son up, laid him on the altar, and raised the knife to kill his son because God spoke to him. And when he raised the knife, the angel shout out, Abraham, Abraham, don't harm the boy. And then we hear this sound, bah, bah. and Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught in the thicket. And he took the ram that God had provided for him and made the sacrifice. Now, in this introduction, I want to share with you five things, kind of principles, because we want to learn God's ways. The first thing that I want you to get from this whole text is that concerning provision, God sees ahead and provides. That's the first point. Concerning provision, God what? God what? He sees ahead and provides. 
Here's the second point. I want to give you five introductory points. The ram or the provision was on the mountain waiting for Abraham to show up. The ram, they're not going to put it up on the mountain. You've got to be listening. The ram was on the mountain waiting. Come on, say that. The ram, come on, say it. The ram, so the ram was there before Abraham got there. So the ram, listen carefully, was on the mountain of obedience. Waiting for Abraham. Waiting for Abraham. Saul, obedience released into view the manifestation of what was already there. Okay. Let's settle that. I'm going to let you mail on that. Obedience released the manifestation of what was already there. Yes, sir. Now, I can't prove this. You can't disprove it. <laughs> but I believe that ram was on that mount waiting, and God closed its mouth. My Lord. Because Abraham had to obey first. And once Abraham raised the knife, God saw it as completed. Obedience was complete. He opened the mouth of the ram, and Abraham heard, ah, yes, ah. yes, The ram was already there, yes, but Abraham didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And just because you can't see it, doesn't mean that the provision is not already there. Okay, 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 okay. Here's the third point that I want to make in my introduction. God doesn't find out about our need when we do. God doesn't find out about your need when you do. Did you hear that, Columbus? Did you hear that, online listener? Did you hear that, Birmingham? God doesn't find out about your need when you do. Let's unpack that for a minute. Let's... let's, let's Let's, let's stay at third one for a minute. Now, listen carefully. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, won't be on the monitor, I'm just quoting now. It says, for by him all things are created, watch this now, that are in the heavens and in the earth, invisible and visible. Right away, the text communicates to us, Colossians 1, 16, it communicates to us that there are two worlds. There is the world of the spirit, the spirit world. Yes, sir. That's called heaven. And then there is the world, then there's the natural world, and it's called earth. These two worlds, heaven, the spirit world, and earth, the natural world, are running concurrently. It means, it, 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 that implies that they're functioning all at the same time. We are more conscious of earth, the natural world, because that's where we live. Yes, sir. We are less conscious of the spirit world. 
Now, for, the, for those of you that are looking at me, and maybe you're listening to, to this broadcast, or maybe you're listening, you can't see me. I am standing on a stage, and there are people in the audience, and specifically the people in the lower seats. This will be true even in Columbus. There's some lower seats, and then there's a stage that's above. This stage that I'm on is on another level. The, st the seats that you're sitting in is on a, on a lower level. Imagine in your mind, in your mind, that this stage area that I'm on is the spirit world. And imagine that the seats that you're on, on the lower level, is earth. It's the natural world. And these worlds are running concurrently. That means they are running at the same time. But there are di there's a big difference between the space here, the, the spirit world, than earth where you're operating at. So let's look at the difference right, right quick. Number one, this world that God operates on is invisible. The earth that you're operating in every day is visible. That's what the Scripture says. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not real. The throne that God sits on is real. The chair that you're sitting in in the audience is real. God's throne is invisible. Your chair is visible. God's throne is more real than the chair you're sitting on <laughs> because God and his throne existed before that chair was created. Let's look at something else about the two worlds. The spirit world is eternal. There is no time, no beginning, no end in eternity. That's why God can never be late. That's why God is never in a hurry. Because in the world that he operates in, there is no time. The natural world is time-based. It's temporary. God spoke in the creation story on the first day. He said, light be, and light was. And then God separated the light from the darkness, and then God said, I'm going to call the, 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 the light day, and I'm going to call the darkness night. And the Bible says that the morning, the evening and the morning was the first day. That was the beginning of time. God placed you and me in time. Now, I'm going somewhere. So, we're in time, but God is not in time. This world over here, the spirit world, is unchanging. Folk ain't up and down. Everybody in this realm is happy, full of joy, and have peace. And there's no anxiety. There's nothing. It's just constant. Joy and happy all the time. Now, in the world, it's changing. Seasons change. People change. Things change in this world. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. You get anything out of this? This world over here is full of abundance. The world that you're in has lack and scarcity and want. And then our pastor taught us about the limitless God, right? So there's no limits to God's world. That's why God says, if you can believe, all things are, because there's no limitations in this world, none whatsoever. Now, listen carefully. There are limits in the natural world. 
So when God looks from his perspective, he can see the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. So that catches him by surprise. Just because you have a need and you telling God about it doesn't mean he find out about it when you talk to him about it. You just expressing yourself. Because God knew you had the need before you became aware of the need. Does that make sense to you? So here's the scripture. Oh, Lord Jesus. Come on, listen to me. Listen carefully. I spent a lot of time on this because you got to get this. You got to get this. John 17, verse 15 through 17. Here's what Jesus says. He says, Father, I pray not that you take them. I pray that not that you take them, but that you keep them from the. So God intends for you to operate in your world, in your family, on your job, in, in your situation. He intends for us to navigate in this world, but he doesn't want us to be affected by the evil in the world. Verse 16, he said, the reason I'm asking you to keep them from the evil is because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Jesus is saying, oh, Jesus, Jesus is saying, even though I came from this realm down into the earth, the limitations of the earth never hindered me. Because I was not from this world. My source wasn't from this world. Well, guess what Jesus said to, to John, the, 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 uh, the man, uh, Aaron, the, what's that guy named in John 3rd? What that? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Love you. Love you. <laughs> he said, Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, that word born again means born a second time. In other words, you were born in the earth one time. But, the, but there's another birth called the new birth. Now, listen carefully. That word born again literally means born from above. Your origin it's not the earth. I was born in Flint, Michigan, but I lived in Birmingham. So my origin goes all the way back to Flint, Michigan. Come on, saint. Your origin is not here. You are born from above. You are born to live from this arena. That's what gives you the advantage. The advantage is not you working hard because the world works hard. The advantage is not you getting an education, though you should get an education, but that doesn't give you an advantage. The advantage that you have is that you're not from here, so you are not limited to hard work you're not limited to education. You're not limited to manipulation. You are not from here. You are born from above. Then he says, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So the advantage and the connection point is God revealing to you what he sees from this world. I'm going to say that again. Your advantage is God revealing to you what he sees from this world. Because if you don't see from this world, you're going to get caught up in what's happening in your world. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I unpack that a little bit more? You're just on the third one. You were just on my introduction. Don't worry, I'll make up on time. I'll make up on the time. Now, listen at this. 
God does everything first in the spirit world. Say that. Come on, say it again. Okay, so God operates and functions from the spirit world. We operate and function in the natural world. God does everything first in the spiritual world. I'm giving you some quick examples, but I'm showing you how to not worry. I'm showing you the reason why we worry. We worry because we see things from this vantage point. Now watch this. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In the likeness of God, he created he male and female. And then in verse 27, 20, 28, it says, God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Okay. God said to who? Who were them? Okay, Adam and Eve, right? Okay. But notice they were not formed to the second chapter. Second chapter, verse 7, God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Genesis 2, about 22, 23, somewhere along in that line, God took a rib from Adam and made a woman and brought the woman to Adam. Well, who was God talking to over in Genesis 1? Adam and Eve. But they didn't manifest to Genesis 2 because God does everything first in the world of the Spirit. Give you another example. God in Jeremiah 1.5, God said to Jeremiah, listen to what he said to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, before I form you in the womb, I knew you. He said, before you were born, I sanctify you and ordain you a prophet. What? So God said, I knew you before you were born. Because God does everything first in the spirit world. Revelation 13, 8 said that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world, before the world was created. Yet, the Bible says, in the fullness of time, he became flesh. So Jesus, according to the Scripture, died before he was crucified. He died and was raised from the dead in the spirit world before he came in the earth and died and was raised from the dead because God always do everything. First, where? Where? In the spirit world. Now let's look at number four. Now listen, you got to listen carefully. If you don't get this, you're going to be worried. You're going to be tripping. You're going to be suicidal. If you don't get this, here's number four. God stands in eternity. Remember the space that God lives in and operates? He stands in eternity before time. Say before time. He establishes our calling. He prepares the resources for us to fulfill our calling before we are born, saved, called, and become aware of the need. I'm going to come down there in a minute. But in this arena, before time, God establishes a purpose for us, a calling. And before time, he prepares everything that we will need corporately or individually to fulfill that calling. Before we are born... Before we are saved, before we are called, 
And before we become aware of the need and eternity past, before time, God has already made preparation. Okay. Okay. Now, watch this. Come closer. Will you come closer? Come on, come on. Oh, right there. Okay, come closer. Now, listen at this. If that's true, then the dome that costs $16 million and the bridge that costs $26 million and the 100 acres of land and the ministry care center that costs $600,000 existed and were financed in the spirit world. Before there was ever a Mike Moore, before there was an ever Faith Chapel, before there was any of this. Now, that's in eternity. Let me come on down in time. Because we operate where? In time. So, in time, as a graduating senior, I was passing that road out there in front of this, this property and was nothing but woods. I got my first speeding ticket with my graduation money. I down that road, and it was nothing but woods. But in eternity, all this was already established. In time, we were over in that little campus, and we had a 7.30 service, a 9.30 service, and 11.30. That was in time. We were believing God for what had already been done. Our believing God didn't make God do it. It was already done. Okay, come up closer. That's corporate, that's corporate, that's corporate. That's a corporate dream. My wife and I, we were believing for a home. Pete will remember this. That's my wife's nickname. That's not a dude. That's my wife's nickname. <laughs> we were waiting. We were in a starter house where we were paying rent in time. And God spoke and said, why wait? Possess the land. When God said, why wait, possess the land, we began to look for the place to stay. And there was an auction on a house, and we end up getting the house, our first starter house, but it was already established. And eternity passed, what the Word did why wait, possess the land, revealed to us, even though we didn't know it, revealed to us what was already established. Okay. You got to listen out of both your ears now. If you don't listen out of both of your ears, you're going to be crying and begging. The, the, the connection point is a revelation from God. The revelation from God gives you revelation of what God has already done. Does that make sense? Now, listen at this. God has already prepared everything. Say everything. everything. People, places, things you will need corporately or individually to fulfill your destiny. I'm going to say that again. God has already prepared everything you will need to fulfill your individual and corporate destiny. He prepared it before time. As you walk in obedience to God and his instructions and you are led by his spirit, you will walk in the manifestation in time. So, you know, see, when the song said, when I pray God move, in reality, God has already moved. For us, 
He's moving in time. Does that make sense? Am I talking to the right group? Okay, we got to look at two scriptures quick, and then I'll get to the second part. But remember, I just said I was going to introduce you to the second part. That's all I said I was going to do is introduce you to the second part. I got to establish this foundation. If you get this, 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 this hits your spirit. There's nothing that you cannot accomplish with your faith. Nothing, 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 no, nothing. I remind you, we did not have $40 million. We did not have it, but God had it. He just needed a people who could believe for it. Not make it, just believe. Okay, 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 okay. Let's look at First Peter 4. Oh, I got hurt. First Peter 4. You get anything out of this? You ain't got to get but two things. You got to get but two things. Okay, let's look at this. First Peter 1, 4, a New Living Translation says, And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Now, look at that text. Keep it up there. Keep it up there. And we have a priceless where? Inheritance. That's kept where? Now watch. Let the text speak to you. Let it just speak to you. It says kept in heaven. What? Why for you? Why is it kept in heaven for you? When you get there? Is it kept in heaven for you when you get there? No. The text tells us that it's not when we get to heaven. If we read the text, it says, we have an inheritance that's kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled. Watch this. Beyond the reach of change and decay. So that's telling you it, it, the, it's not kept in heaven when you get to heaven because there's no change and no decay in heaven. It's kept in heaven so change and decay won't affect it. That's why we owe some money on the bridge. We owe some money on the bridge. And we paid the bridge off during the pandemic. Yes, sir. Because the inheritance was beyond the change and the decay. See, some people think they can't believe in certain times. But the inheritance was put in heaven, so no matter what's going on, and see, some, oh, Lord, don't mess with that. I almost got into that political thing, but I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. I'll just say this. I know some of y'all hoping on who president, because your life will be better. No, 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 listen. I'm, I'm a voter. I'm a voter. Already voted. I'm going to be out of town. Already voted, okay? I, I'm not saying no vote. I, I'm, I'm voting. But I'm not putting my confidence because I'm not from here. Now, vote your, vote your conscience. I ain't talking about who to vote for. I ain't, I ain't telling you who to vote for. Vote your conscience. I'm just saying, I was born from above. And if you don't think like that, you're going to be all upset and all worried and all that because you think you from here. I ain't going to get in that. Stop trying to pull me in that. Okay, let's look at, let's look at, let's look at, let's look at, let's look at another scripture, and then I'm going to get to part two. But I don't need much time for part two. I don't need much time for part two. Some tell me the people have already gotten their two things. Some, some, some on the inside of me tell me 
that the people in Columbus, I feel like, I just feel like you already got your two things. Okay, okay, okay. We got her. Got her up. Okay, okay. I, I, I see that. I see that clock. I see it. Okay. Mm. God's provision, oh, listen to this, is always to prepare ahead of the God-given vision, mandate, or direction. God's provision is always prepared when? Ahead of the God-given vision, mandate, and direction. That's why the Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither have entered into the hearts of men, listen carefully now, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, the things that God has prepared, has already prepared for them that love them. Now, the challenge for us, now watch this, I'm in, I'm in eternity, right? Okay, so it's prepared where? It's prepared where? Okay, so in time, and that's what Jesus did, he came from eternity to time, in time is when I get the vision. In time is when I get the direction. In time is when I get the mandate. But the provision was prepared before I received the directions. So the beautiful thing about kingdom is when you understand that, your biggest thing should be to get the mind of God to spend enough time praying and spending time with God because watch this, watch this, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. Once God says it, you already know it's there. You, you know it's already prepared. To, so no matter what's happening, because there was a time when the steel was delayed. There always be challenges along the way of your destiny journey, but you're not going to be fooled by it. Because you know if God spoke to you, it's already settled. Because God ain't going to talk to you about something that he hadn't already taken care of. Amen. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Are you the people? Are you the people? So this revelation will remove worry. We, we worry because we are functioning in the natural world, and that's all we can see. Come on, say, but we're not from here. And God's Word reveals to you. So I'm, I'm, I'm just walking, praying, and the Spirit of God, now think about it. We're in three services. You know what we were going to do in time? Build a butler building. Yeah, that, that in time, we were going to build a butler bill. You know why? Because in those days, they would build butler bills that was a little large so you could put chairs in the gymnasium for Sunday, remove the chairs, and have activities through the week. That's, you would have been in a butler building and not in this building. Because that's where I'm going. I'm, I'm in time, and I'm doing natural things, and I'm just walking, and, and the Spirit of God said, don't. Dome. I'm like this. You want us to build a dome? What God is doing, he's revealing his perspective. He's revealing what he sees. Now, if we'll take our actions and align our actions, because the moment he said dome, we forgot about the butler building. We start researching dome. We start researching dome. Now we are bringing ourselves in alignment. We don't have the manifestation yet, but we are bringing our actions in alignment with God has said. Most people wait for the manifestation, then they're going to do something. No, no, no. That's not how it works. You get the revealed word from God, the direction, the mandate, now you're in business. Does this make sense? Did you get that? 
Okay, okay, let me talk. I got six minutes and 16 seconds for me to just introduce what we're going to talk about next week. Put 2 Corinthians, please, up on there, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. This is going to be the foundation text uh, of what we're going to be dealing with. And notice what it says. And we'll get into the we'll, we'll get into it a little deeper next week, okay? But it says God is able to make what? All 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 okay. I give you a quick definition, but again, again, here again. Listen, if I run through it, I'm just introducing you to it. We're gonna get into it. So I give you a general definition of grace, okay? Grace is God acting in us and doing for us what we cannot do on our own. See that definition? Say it. Let's let's read it. Let, let's read it again. Come on, Columbus. Let's read it. Come on, come on. Okay, now listen, listen at, at, at this. God is, put that text back up there and just leave it up there. Leave 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8 up there and just leave it up there. Thank you for doing that. Okay, now look at that and we're going to close with this. God is what? God doing in us, for us, what we could not. God is. Okay, oh, God is. God is. Wait, wait, God is. 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 Now, think about your dream. Think about your vision. Think about what you want to do. God is. God is. God is. God is. All this was created by God is able. God is what? to do for us and in us what we can't do for ourselves. So if we don't have the money, but God said do it, and God said do it debt free, then he is able, therefore we are able to make all grace. We'll get into it. That's Dimensions, that's facets of grace. Dimensions and facets of grace. I'll talk to you about that next week. Dimensions and facets of grace. Salvation grace. Favor grace. Strength grace. Ability grace. We get into it in detail. And then there is provision grace. Provision grace. Will you put that definition of provision grace up there? I got two minutes. <laughs> provision grace is supernatural supply of material resources to accomplish God's perfect will in life and service. That's what God gave us, provision grace. You know how I know it? I know much, how much money we had in the bank. <laughs> I also know the history of the giving in the church. 
I knew what came through the offerings, not because I'm looking at everybody's name. You know, you just get a report because you're the head. You know what I mean. But I'm saying I know that we don't have this. We don't have it. And maybe next week I could tell you how it scared me. Because I want to be very transparent. This scared me. Because I knew we did not have that much money. But God gave us provision, grace. Hmm? Hmm? Oh, 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 yeah, I gave it to you, you just missed it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank, who, who did that? Thank you, sweetheart. 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 I, I, I want to close out with this. It, okay, oh, number five. God's provision is always prepared ahead of the God-given vision, mandate, and direction. That was number five. That's when I walked down. Stand up, Ronald. Priscilla is in here, Priscilla Reynolds, Priscilla Reynolds. What we're going to see next week is, is the, this grace flows to us mutual benefit. Today, we talked a lot about the church and the church paying off this. Got it? I give you four examples of how what happens in the church should be spilling into your life. God is able to make all, watch this, abound toward so that you have all sufficiency in all things. That's personally. Abound toward every good work is ministry kingdom. Like the, the relief thing given to the poor, given to the church. Okay, that's everything. That, that, there's two sides to it. Ronald's been with me a lot of years, and whenever I travel, Ronald will be with me. He's my, he my Barnabas. He listens to everything I teach. He listens to everything I teach, and he takes it and applies it to his paint business. Because he believed that everything that happened to the church should happen to him. Priscilla, she's moving out into a reset business. I don't have all the details, but she, she be, this ministering to the homeless and, and, and getting the homeless back on their feet. And, and God has been blessing her with the resources supernaturally. There was a man in our church. I was at an event, and he came up to me. He in a trucking business. I don't know if he in here. Maybe he ain't in here. I wish he would. I'll ask him to stand. But he came running up to me recently. He, he said, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike. He said, he said Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike. He, he said, uh, either he had a truck or no trucks or whatever, but he heard the word. And now he got his trucking business. I'm, I'm teaching you now. I'm teaching you now. I'm teaching you now. I'm teaching you now. I was, at, I was going to a funeral and preaching a funeral at another church, and a man ran up to me. He said, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike. He said, I will listen to that, that series on the God of Abundance. And I, I just listened to that over and over and over and over. And you know what he told me? He said, now I got an 8,000-square-foot feet house. It's almost paid for. Got an elevator. Got three floors. And he was going on and on and on. Okay, okay. What is the common denominator? What is the common denominator? He got a word from God. She got a word from God. The man in the trucking business got a word from God. And the man with the 8,000-square-feet house got a word from God. That's how this thing is supposed to work. But if you only hear out of one ear, it'll be just a good sermon. 
Does that make sense? Can I close now? Okay. Okay. 